Oh, and never, yeah, I know it. And, and all right. Hey, we're going to begin by singing. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a hymn, O Worship the King, but it has a nice little chorus attached to it. It should be very familiar. So stand with us and uh, let's begin this day by just turning our attention to the Lord. So let's sing to Him. shows daily. Um, start off with um, our connections card. If, connect, yeah, not, yeah. So fill that out if you've got something you need uh, leadership to know or if you've got a prayer request or just any need, um, want to join the church, anything like that, put it on there. Um, as always, the ties and everything are in the box in the back and got a list of stuff here. Um, Culture shock. Uh, Brian and Maria are starting a young adult Sunday school class uh, covering uh, relevant topics today uh, homosexuality, abortion, church, politics, sex, truth. Anyway, they're going to be ordering books um, for study guides. So if you want to do that, let them know so that they can order the appropriate amount of, uh, of literature. And I think it'll be in room five over there. Okay, got a handout that's got uh, deacon and deaconess's duties. Um, so if you got something you need, uh, you're in need of something, prayer, you know, whatever it is, um, these are the folks that can help you, and this is what they can help you with. So um, look at this, consult it, and uh, and we want to take care of the flock. We want to take care of each other, but if we don't know. We can't do anything, so do not hesitate to let people know. Um, elder meeting, uh, Tuesday night at 645, um, so if you've got something that we need to know about, you're welcome to come. November the 8th is our business meeting, so be sure to be here for that immediately after uh, the service. 
Uh, daylight savings time ends, so turn your clocks back, fall back, spring forward, fall back, uh, turn your clocks back one hour before you go to bed Saturday night, next Saturday night, so you're not, um, miss your church time. Uh, first Thursday prayer time, we've got this, um, I don't know if anybody knows, it's been in the news, but there's an election uh, that Tuesday, um, the 3rd, so we're going to do first Tuesday prayer time on the first Monday. So it'll be a little confusing. Brian, are you listening? Brian, you listening? Okay. Um, so first Tuesday prayer time is going to be on first Monday, the second, which is going to be advantageous because then we can pray for elections. I got the nod from Dr. Bob, so I know I'm, I'm on track. <laughs> Uh, young adult Sunday school, um, I already mentioned that, so I won't do it again. Uh, 2020 Grace Upon Grace Women's Conference at uh, the Marvelous Hickman Community Church. Uh, they've invited our women and their women over 13, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful time. going to be uh, $50 on November the 6th and the 7th, and uh, it's usually a good time. We do their men's uh, conference, too, so we appreciate them sharing with us. And that's about it. Anything that I've left out? Anybody think of anything? Brian, it's always good to see you. <laughs> Kelsey. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father, thanks for today, just for this body of believers and, um, and where you brought us, our individual situations. Um, I just thank you that we don't have to be here forever, that we've got... Um, We've got something unbelievable to look forward to. And uh, the Bible says that uh, we, we can't imagine what heaven is going to be like. But uh, um, I know we all look forward to being there. Um, but in the meantime, we're here. We're here to do your work. Um, we're here to do the things that you present uh, before us. Some of them are uh, big things. Some of them are little things. But they're all things that you want done. And... Uh, and uh, just, just teach us uh, to apply the lessons that we learned to be uh, blessings to people's lives and just to do what it is that you want us to do with a cheerful heart. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, these uh, next songs just, just focus on the majesty and the might of, of God, that he's a good and gracious king and that he reigns. Uh, that's one constant that will always be constant, right, is, is that God reigns. He is who he is, and he will always be who he is. So as we uh, sing these songs, I just encourage you to uh, listen to the words as you sing them out and think about the, the fact that uh, God is Lord. He is constant over our lives and over our situations and over the struggles and the fears and everything. He is God, and he reigns. So stand with us, and let's sing together, God, you reign. Say, my song remains. God, 
love I am accepting. You're a good and gracious King. Oh, what grace that you would see me as your child and as your friend. Safe, secure in you forever. I pour out my praise again. You deserve the greater glory. And overcome, I lift my voice. To the King in need of nothing. Empty handed, I. You're a good and gracious King. Sing holy, holy. Your desire. 
desire sanctified by glory and fire now I found the greatest love of all is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice Just as I so much for being who you are and true to your word for providing for us salvation we simply stand here with nothing in our hand that we bring but lord truly to the cross we cling thank you for our savior thank you for jesus lord be glorified in us in this time we pray in jesus name amen Well, as we continue in worship, um, I'm going to do something that will probably frustrate you, maybe some of you. Uh, I do have a scripture reading, so I'm going to ask that you would stand once again with me. <laughs> I didn't get to the pulpit quick enough. I know, oh, that's on me. That's my, that's my fault. I do want to finish up, and I know we'll have a time of communion here in a moment, but I do want to finish up Psalm 119. This is our last uh, section. It's... Uh, Verses 169 through 176. Um, as we come to the end of, end of October and um, 
you know, heading into uh, the message this morning and communion and just this psalm. Of course, all of it has been good, but it, it resonates well, right, with the truth of God and his word and uh, who he is. So this is Psalm 119. I'm going to begin in verse 169 through the end of it, right, 176. And the psalmist says, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteous, righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for salvation, your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you. And let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And the Lord blast the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you for, for standing once again. The psalmist ends by saying, I, I remember your commandments. And you know, this morning we want to have a time of, of communion. And um, we come straight to the, to the commandment of Scripture as Jesus. If you see me doing this, I haven't turned Catholic. It's, it's the fly that's going on around here, okay? <clears throat> Uh, Jesus, I know that was not really good, but I'm just, I know this is going to be happening. So as, as the psalmist presses and says, Lord, I, you know, I look forward to your salvation and I, I, I look and follow your precepts and you see this, this sovereign hand of God over the psalmist and yet you see his, his human responsibility, right? He, he stresses that, that I will choose you, I will follow after you. And at the same time, he acknowledges Uh, Lord, let your word come, let it stand, let your salvation be with me. And so this morning, as we want to take time and and, uh, enjoy and worship the Lord with what he has done for us in the cross of Jesus Christ, we we want to come to the communion table and we see this, uh, this command where Jesus commands us to remember communion, to remember what he has done. And, and we see this, this, um, um, I want to say duality, I guess it would be the right word, but we see the sovereign hand of God and we see his, his providing for us that he so loved the world because he is love. He sends his son and yet uh, we know he is sovereign and yet we have a responsibility to believe on Christ. And we know that there's some mystery there, but we see this and this morning we come and uh, Lord, we look to your commandments to be obedient and we trust And what uh, he has provided, and Jesus gives us these words as Paul's giving us this instruction. He's he's recording or writing down what the Lord has given him. And so uh, preparing for communion is simply this. Paul tells us, this is 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, the same night in which he is betrayed, Knowing all of this, he takes bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance. There's the command. Remember what Christ has done. He says, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Remembering what Christ has done. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. This morning, that's what we want to do is acknowledge the gospel of Jesus Christ. That as God is holy and no one can live in his presence. And, and you and I as, as saints and sinners, right? And, and uh, knowing that there's no way I could overcome my sin, there had to be a sacrifice for us. Christ had to come. And he had to pay this bread on the same night in which he is betrayed. He is teaching this, this commandment to his church, ultimately to his church, uh, in the presence of his disciples, uh, for us to remember this. It is the gospel. Um, Paul goes on, he gives some instructions. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty 
of the body and blood of the Lord. But let the man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. See, this morning, uh, we want to be sure that we understand exactly, we want to take time and, and reflect upon our sins and ask the Lord to uh, forgive us. Does anyone else have a fly problem? Is that just me? I just... Um, but to be in a, in, a, in a mode of seriousness before the cross and to understand what Christ has done and to simply acknowledge that there's no other way. Uh, there is one way, and Christ has provided it for us. So I'd like to pray here in a moment, and then I'm going to invite our ushers and, and us, um, uh, excuse me, our elders and deacons to come and help hand out the elements. But uh, before they do, let's, let's just take a moment and pray. Father, we do thank you uh, for your love and uh, your mercy. We thank you for the cross. Uh, we acknowledge this morning that there is no way in which we can come before you except through the, the shed blood of our Savior, Jesus. Uh, we come into your throne room of grace in the name of Jesus and nothing else. And we ask, God, that you would cleanse us and forgive us, that we would have right uh, fellowship and communion with you, that we would hear your voice, that we would be, uh, Lord, obedient, and, uh, Lord, ultimately, you'd be glorified in us. Uh, we acknowledge that the cross is necessary. Although there was nothing forcing you to, um, to save us, Lord, there was nothing behind you or, or bigger than you that was making you do this. You are love, and you sent your Son. But it was necessary for Christ to come and die. And upon that cross, we might have forgiveness. There might be a, a, an atonement for us, an appro propitiation from you that satisfied completely. Uh, we know you don't lower your standard of perfection. You maintain it. And the only way that anyone can stand in your presence is through the shed blood of Jesus. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. I pray now, Lord, for each of us this morning that, uh, Father, as we focus upon um, this time of communion, that you would reveal by your spirit uh, sins that we need to lay down, uh, sins that we need to confess and repent of, that we would come in a, in a manner that is worthy and focused upon you, uh, in a manner that is desiring to, to simply be obedient. So we pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would minister to us and be with us, and, uh, and let us be very mindful and remind how precious and important the gospel is. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite the, the uh, elders and deacons, those who are coming to help hand out the elements, if you would come uh, at this time. I, you know, because of corona and um, the coronavirus, you know, the, the cups are individually wrapped, which if you've been here a few times, you'll see that. Um, please don't handle the, the plates. The ushers will do that. We'll take care of that. Uh, grab one, hold on to it, and then we'll take the elements together. You don't have to be a member of Faith Community Bible Church to take communion, but you do need to be a believer because that's what we are acknowledging and remembering.
Many of us are ready for that, right? And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. It is our custom, and when we take communion, to uh, take a benevolence fund, and it's above your, your, uh, your offering to the church. And so if you're prepared to do that today, and, and uh, we want to pray over that, um, please mark it as that and put it in the box in the back, and of course your offering in the box as well. But let's, let's pray. Father, again, thank you for the cross. Thank you for our Savior. We acknowledge again uh, this is the only way. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to you except through him. And we thank you, Lord, that we have him today. And we don't have him in part, we have him in full. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for providing salvation for us. Uh, we do ask, Lord, for um, your hand and blessing to be upon the offering and the benevolence fund. For those prepared to give today, Lord, give us a right understanding and right motive to give, that our, our desire would, would simply to be worship, to worship you, to say thank you for your many blessings. Uh, Lord, that we'd have the desire to see your kingdom grow and lives come to know you, to see the gospel proclaimed. Uh, so Lord, give us that heart, and I pray your, your blessing over the, the offering, that it would be used to those, those ends and that purpose. And we pray over the benevolence fund, those prepared to, to uh, give to that, that it would be as well a blessing to many families that we can encourage and help them through difficult times. We commit it all to you. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, men. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, if you would uh, turn in your Bibles back to the Psalms. And some of you are thinking, that doesn't sound quite right. Uh, but if you would turn to Psalm 46. You know, this is the Sunday before uh, what, what we most of us know, uh, October 31st, as Halloween. Um, it's for, for, for the church. If you understand church history, it is uh, the Reformation Sunday. Right, on October 31st, back in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church door in, in Wittenberg, Germany. And that sounds kind of defiant, like, right? If you know, went and just nailed it to the, to the church door. But he had 95 theses, 95 grievances, 95 things that he wanted to debate, but that was how you went about it. If there was something you wanted to debate with uh, the church in that day, you would uh, nail it to the church door. And so on October 31st, uh, 1517, Martin Luther did that over 500 years ago, and uh, he wrote his 95 Thesis in Latin. He was well-educated, wrote them in Latin. That's how the church functioned. Uh, back then, the church was, everything was in Latin. Uh, you attended. If there was songs, it was in Latin, so people didn't sing along. Um, everything was pretty much done that way. And so... Uh, he, had, he had all these grievances, and he went to the right proper channels. He wrote it all in Latin, and he had them nailed to the, to the church for debate. He went about this process. And so what Martin Luther wanted for debate, initially, the Lord wanted to bring about a reformation. Uh, in history, someone, we don't know uh, who this person was, took those 95 theses and translated them into German. And it just so happens around this time, the printing press is being uh, developed, these get printed, they get circulated, and guess what? <clears throat> the Reformation is on, right? And, and it, it has begun. So what he initially started out to, to do was simply debate things such as indulgences, uh, things such as salvation is only in the church and not through Christ alone. Uh, he wanted to debate the, what we know out of the Reformation, the five solas, right? Uh, sola uh, gratia, grace alone, and, and sola fede, faith alone, and 
and sola Christos and Christ alone and solo scriptura through God's word alone and and one we're, we're probably more familiar with sola gloria uh, sole deo gloria there it is uh, which is what does anyone know that anyone big fans of Christmas sola deo no okay to God alone be the glory I'll just give you that one uh, to God alone be the glory and those were the five solas we're in Latin right and those were the solas that came out of the Reformation. And he wanted to debate all of these things. He wanted to debate the communion, of course, all these. There was 95 of them. And much of what came out of the Reformation, uh, as it began to, to spread and began to split, we became known as Protestants. And today we are Protestants. And the, the word Protestant literally means protest. And we protest the Catholic Church. See, today we believe salvation is in Christ alone. We believe that it's Christ in his shed blood and not through the church. The Catholic Church believes that only salvation is in the Catholic Church. And if you are outside that church, they pronounce anathema. And you can look at all these things through history. And it's not my point to get into that this morning. But um, this is where it began, this, this break. And w- the reason I wanted to go to Psalm 46 is this, this moment of uh, Martin Luther's life. You know, he set out to to debate. He was reading the Bible and, and said, I don't think we have some of these things right. right. And he set out in the right ways and the proper channels to have a debate with the church, and the Lord had used it for uh, the Reformation. And, and today we see what, you know, Protestants, what we are today. Well, in this time of, of going through all this and going through the Reformation, there were times, and you can imagine in Martin Luther's life, that there were times he had to run and hide. They were going to kill him. There were times he was brought before councils and he was asked to recant. And some of those, uh, that famous line, you know, I'm bound by my uh, conviction, understanding of Scripture. I will not recant unless you show me otherwise. Right? There was his conviction. And because he stood upon uh, sola, right, uh, scriptura, Scripture alone, because of the Bible, he says, this is where it is. And he was big on getting the, the Bible translated. He actually translated the Bible into German. Uh, which was considered a really good translation, that the people would have the Bible. And, and, and he alone, of course, didn't do this. We know God is sovereign, but the people were ready for Reformation. They were desiring, they were seeing the abuses of the church and the selling of indulgences, and, and which was paying money for sins, right? You could pay money and get someone out of purgatory, or uh, you could pay for your sins that you committed last week. And it got so bad that you could actually pay for future sins, Right, and this is pretty true. There is a story. I forget the name of the the priest who was uh, selling these these indulgences, and someone came and said, "Can we pay for future sins?" Absolutely, give your money. And of course, the future sin was robbing the priest. Right, so they they gave money for the future sin and then robbed him. Right, so that that was the climate of the Reformation. People were ready for the word of God, and God was stirring, and and we see this happening. But in Martin Luther's life. Uh, he was full. This is what I want to get to this morning is, you know, he, he went through a lot of, I would imagine, uncertainty. You know, one of the things the church tried to tell him is like, you're responsible. If you're saying people are saved outside of the church, you're responsible for all these people going to hell. And you can imagine him going back through the scriptures and studying the scriptures and, and having these moments of, of wavering. Have you ever felt wavering? Have you ever felt fear? Have you ever felt uncertainty? Have you ever felt dread? Have you ever had these moments where you just feared for your life and maybe you have or haven't, but clearly this is happening in his life and part of the Reformation. There was times he had to run and he had to hide. Now, there were great names coming out of the Reformation. There was John Calvin in Geneva and John Knox uh, in, um, in Scotland and you know, real giants who were going to say simply God's word alone is his word and, and the church is not the final authority. Right? We can go into the throne room of grace individually because of Christ. But you know, experiencing all those things, and so it was said that Martin Luther would often come to Psalm 46. In moments of fear and dread and uncertainty and running for his life, he would say to his friend uh, Philip uh, Melanchthon, he would say, come Philip, let us sing once again Psalm 46. And it's out of Psalm 46, if you're familiar with his hymn that he wrote, a mighty fortress is our God. It came from this psalm. And so often in moments of dread and uncertainty of life, he would say, come, let us sing once again Scripture. 
right? And that was the drive of the Reformation, back to the Bible, back to what it says. And you can imagine uh, going through life and feeling, uh, you know, confusion and uncertainty and what he would drive back and say, what does the Bible say? And he would come often. One of his favorite psalms is Psalm 46. And so I'd like to just kind of uh, read it now and then we'll preach through it a little bit and pull some, some things we can grab hold of in our own lives. Because I believe every single one of us being human has had moments of uncertainty and fear, of questioning, going through trials. Is God? Where is God? What's God doing? And so, so Martin Luther would come to this, and this is what it says, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and throw, and, excuse me, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our strength. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth, at the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word this morning. I ask God now that your spirit would instruct us and teach us uh, for the many uh, trials and situations of life that we are going through this very moment, this day, or the things ahead of us. I ask, God, that, that the truth of your word would resonate deep in us that we would realize you are a mighty fortress and you are always with us. And so, Lord, we uh, commit this time again to you. I pray that every thought and life would be fixed upon you and that I would be taken away, that you would receive the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come to Psalms 46, just a little brief uh, background. Um, it was a set unsettling time, I should say, for... Uh, Jerusalem and Judea, King Hezekiah was leading as scholars believe, and, and they were in the midst of, uh, of a battle, of a war raging of, with the, from the Assyrians. And so Hezekiah, and, and of course it is, it is said that, that uh, he clinged and, and believed and trusted in the Lord, and ultimately we, uh, we see the victory. If you look at Psalms 46 and 47 and 48, but uh, it's important to note that through a troubling, or excuse me, a, a, uh, a troubling, there it is, a troubling time um, is happening. In the context of difficulty and uncertainty, uh, you have this psalm which resonates. And you can imagine as Martin Luther going through what he was going through, we turn to this psalm and you can see why. And I think it's important for us as we see you know, others of Scripture, as you think of Job uh, lamenting. Right and, and losing everything and his friends coming and sitting with him for, uh, for many days and not even speaking, unable to speak. And yet when he opens his mouth, he says, for the very thing that I'm greatly feared has come upon me and that which I dread has happened to me. Now I can imagine that in our own lives there are, there are trials, there are uh, moments where you say the very worst thing I have feared now is happening. The very thing that I did not want to have happen, it is unfolding in front of me. I think as humans, there's times where maybe we have wondered that very statement. What is going to happen now? What is going to go on? What is the Lord doing? We're filled with these questions, and it might be something as simple as a struggle within the family, a struggle with uh, the loss of a loved one, right, as Job experienced. Maybe it's something that has to do with the physical 
a struggle that we have to do with our own bodies. I mean, it can go on and, and on. We could quickly make a long list of things that can consume our thoughts and our, our emotions, and fill us with dread, fill us with worry, and we would be uncertain, and we would almost come to a point of being unable to move. Well, take hearts, brothers and sisters. This psalm is for that very purpose. In this difficult time in King Hezekiah's life, they were clinging to this fact. Our God reigns. He reigns. He is awesome. He has power. He has everything that is necessary. And you see an attitude written in this psalm that even if, even if things don't work out as I, as I desire them, we should have peace because he reigns. So as we look at this psalm, a few things I'd like to point out. And the first one is taken from verses 1 through 3, is that uh, God is, and this is a fact, a mighty refuge. He is a mighty refuge. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. We should almost just stop right there, unpack that, and say, look at this, right? Amen and amen. He goes on and says, therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. What a picture he's painting for us. Though the waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Then we see the word selah, which is a pause or a rest, a contemplation. And there's three things that I think we need to understand about this mighty refuge that is uh, the God of Scripture. And the first thing is our refuge in God is personal. Right? The psalmist doesn't say, hey, I heard of a guy one time who had this thing, who believed this one thing. Right? He straight from the very beginning says, God is our refuge. Not, you know, your second cousin removed by so-and-so. No, it is our refuge. He's our refuge and our strength. And the idea of, of a refuge literally means a place to which we go quietly for protection. There was a pastor given some, some thought to this passage, and he was thinking about when he was growing up in Britain during World War II and, and how when the German uh, bombers would come and how him and his family would, would flee into the house and his dad at the very beginning would just put his family under the table thinking, well, this might work. And he said a few bombs got relatively close, and it changed Dad's thinking. So he went out, and he dug a deep hole, and he lined it the best he could, and pretty soon they had a refuge. We had a place to go, and he was so convinced that it was so good that it would withstand anything but a direct hit. We had this confidence as a family. We had this personal thing that we can go and, and hide into, but there's an element of saying, there's a direct hit. Yeah, we may not. See, God isn't like that. You can think of the strongest place, the most quiet place the, the, of protection on this earth, and yet it's very personal, and yet God is saying, no, it's, it's better than this. The psalmist just doesn't simply say he's our refuge. He attaches the word strength. And, you know, if you're going through issues and problems and trials and concerns and things weighing on your heart, guess what? You have a refuge in a very personal way. So it's one of the things that we love about, one of the many things, of course, we love about how the Word tells us and teaches us about God is we know He's omnipresent. But we know in His omnipresence, He is ever-present. There's not a percentage of Him here with us today and a percentage of Him at this other place and, and you know, 72% of Him is over here. No, He's ever-present, 100% omnipresent, right? Always, everywhere. See, when you go and you cry out to God, just as the psalmist is saying, look, he is our God, he's our refuge and our strength in very personal terms, you have that ability today if you know him. If you know him through his son, Christ. He is our refuge in a very personal way. The psalmist goes on the second part of verse 1. He's a very present help in trouble. Our refuge in God is powerful. There's not a time where we think, well, some, sometimes he gets it right and sometimes he's, you know, it's like 50-50. There's none of that here, right? It's the fact that our refuge in God is powerful. It's full of strength 
right in the present. It's the right thing we need at the right time. The word trouble literally means in tight places. Have you ever been in a tight place? A situation you're not sure what are we going to do? I think that relates to every single one of us. And you can see as Martin Luther thinking about moments of being in tight places of hiding and wondering if someone's going to find him and, and ultimately kill him. You can imagine him coming back to this and saying, no, he's a real personal help. He's a powerful help. The psalmist goes on in verses 2 and 3 where I say our refuge is God, or excuse me, our refuge in God is permanent. Look at his, look at his reasoning here. Verse 2, therefore... Right? If God is this, therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. Because God is, there's the indicative, God is this, and because he reigns, therefore the imperative, I am not going to fear. Right? Though the earth be removed, and listen to this, the earth uh, can be translated land. Right? And the, the word remove can be translated change. And the idea is if the land was to change hands. See, so if you're facing an army from Assyria and they're looking at this, and even though the Assyrian armies, they may come, they may beat us, and though we may not be in the land, and I still have reason not to fear. My God doesn't depart on me. He doesn't check out on me. He doesn't say, good try. You almost got it. Maybe next time. We may feel that way, but that's not the God of Scripture. God is constant, and His refuge is permanent. See, when you're in Christ, you cannot lose that salvation. His hand holds you. The sovereign God of the world who spoke and created holds your hand, your life in His hand. That's who He is. And though the the land may change hands... We will not fear. Though this situation does not work out like I want it to, I will not fear. God is constant. He is permanent. And he paints this picture for us. Though the waters right, roar and are troubled and, and the mountains shake with their swelling, right, and all this stuff happens, and though basically uh, the worst thing that happens, an earthquake, right, rips everything apart, and sometimes we feel that, right, in our lives, things being ripped apart, and though it's cast into the sea, the next thing you know, this is responding with some type of tsunami, right, this is the picture we have. Even if it's that bad, we have no reason to fear. Now, that might sound you know, easy to say and difficult to follow, but this is the reality. The Bible does not try to convince you ever otherwise. This is who he is. Right? And you think of the heroes of the faith, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Won't you bow the knee? No, I don't need to have a conversation about it. My God is able to, to, to redeem me, to rescue me, even if he doesn't. I'm not going to change. See, this is the confidence the psalmist begins with. If you're going through trials and, and situations today, if there's things weighing on you and there's uncertainty in your life and, and maybe to the point of, of you're doing your best on a Sunday morning to keep up the right, the right look and the right response, but inwardly you're falling apart, well, this is for you, isn't it? God won't check out. God doesn't give in. God doesn't give up. He's permanent. He's powerful. He's personal. That's who he is. That's how the psalmist begins. And you can imagine uh, Martin Luther referring to this. I can see why he was singing this psalm. I can see why he wrote a hymn based on this. This is who he is. And I think we need to understand that. So the question we have to have and you have to ask this of yourself is what is it? What is it that is, that is causing you fear right now? What is it that is making you uh, doubt or question God's love or his ability. I think it's time to take courage because God doesn't change. There's sin, we need to confess it. We need to come to the cross. If we don't know Jesus, it's time for salvation. Enjoy who the Lord is. So we learn right from the first few verses here that God is a mighty refuge. He's a mighty refuge. 
The psalmist goes on in verses 4 through 7 where I say God is constantly present. Now I can, my wife can attest to this. I rewrote this, this second point many times trying to get the right, uh, say it correctly, but I landed here. He is constantly present. That sounds uh, repetitive, but I believe it needs to be something deep within you that God is constant. The, the psalmist refers to him as a river, right? There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. See a thing developing there, don't we? The idea of river is, is this constantly flowing river that, that we can be encouraged and, and it's not a creek that sometimes swells when the snow melts, right? It's, it's a constantly flowing river. And because of this, because of this is who God is, and because he's constant, right? Uh, and he's constantly with us, constantly present, we can be at all times refreshed in him, Verse 4, right? There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, a holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. And the psalmist has this idea once again that the Lord can refresh us in the midst of difficulty and trouble. He doesn't wait for you to figure things out. No, he's, he is always there. He is constantly present. He's waiting for us to cry out and call out to him because this is who he is. He has unfailing love. He offers rejuvenating waters. He offers encouragement to us. And it's only in Him. It's only in Him. And again, we see in, in the, this sovereign hand of who God is, and yet this, this element of responsibility in us. And we do need to call out to Him. We do need to cry out to Him. You know, if we want to have this kind of peace and comfort, well, um, we must draw close. Paul says it like this in Philippians 4, 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's available to us. Refreshment is, is waiting on us. You need to be calling out. You need to be praying. The psalmist goes on. This is letter B, if you've been following along, uh, under point two. Uh, God protects us and gives us rest. He says, God is in the midst of her. She, uh, she shall not be moved. So God dwells right in the city. He protects the city. How does he do this today? He does it through his Holy Spirit. How does he do it in your life? He does it through the Holy Spirit's activity in your life. Right On the, on the day of salvation, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Right? It's not that Christ lives in our heart, that Christ is our mediator. The Spirit seals us unto the day of redemption. And Paul simply says this, going to Romans chapter 8, verse 9, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Right? How does God provide rest? How does he provide uh, protection? How does he do this? Well, he guides us by his Spirit. And we see in this passage as well, you know, even though the, the mountains, right, and, and are cast into the sea and the sea roars up, even in the context of difficulty, here we find yet again, right, rest and peace. The psalmist continues in, in the first, or excuse me, second part of verse 5, God gives us hope of a bright tomorrow. Notice when he says, God shall help her just at the break of day. I remember if you've ever heard that, that saying, you know, God misses a lot of opportunities to come early, but he's never late, right? So, well, God always comes on time. God always does what God's going to do. It just feels like that for us, right? God, you could have came earlier. Could have did this a little sooner, right? Um, but it's always at the break of dawn. You see the psalmist has one eye to the future. See, it might be difficult. The season of life you're walking through might be full of brokenness and hurt. And, and misunderstanding or not understanding. But we know there is a day when all things will be made new. 
there's a future that awaits all of God's children. We know there's going to be no sorrow, no suffering, no pain, no death. So the believer in this life has this confidence. Though this situation doesn't change, and though this is where I struggle, and this is what I'm working through, there is a day that is coming. There's a day that is coming. I love Revelation 21, 4 and 5. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. See, in the, the, the walk of the, the Christian, right, we struggle through life. We're not different than anyone else, but we have something the world is desperate for and, of course, won't, won't come to understand it or come to believe on Christ, but we have a hope that cannot be shaken, a real hope. We know that in this life, though it, though it is painful and it's full of uncertainty and moments of brokenness, we know there's a day where there's no more of that. That encourages us. The psalmist goes on in verse 6, and I say, God has given us his word. He says, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. You know, notice the confidence, the power, the might of God. You know, there's... God speaks and the storms are ruled, the hearts are dissolved, the, the enemies that are, that are assembling are annihilated, right? Everything is debilitated. There is nothing that stands against him. You know, as a New Testament church, uh, we have God's word right here in the, in the context. He's speaking of God's speaking, right? God's authority, God's might, and, and we have that in, uh, in binding form, right? We have it with leather bound and different kinds of skin, right? So you got goat skin and uh, everything else we can have with it. And yet we often neglect the very reading of God's word, and yet here it is. You know, the Bible never goes the other direction, it always goes uh, forward. This is who he is. We should be growing and, and moving forward, but you have to be opening it. You've got to be reading it. We have to have the conviction like the reformers, uh, like Martin Luther and Calvin. They said, when you open up God's word and it is, it is properly taught, the words uh, that come from that are actually God's words. It's as if God is speaking. You know, we need to have that conviction today. One of the, the things I love about John MacArthur's ministry is, as Tim Challies was writing about it, he said the very foundation of his whole ministry is that he believed the word of God was, the, in fact, the word of God. That when we open it and we, we taught it and we teach it, that God is speaking. That's the conviction that we have to have is that this is true. It is right. It is real. God reigns and this is a fact. And he is the refuge. He is constantly with us. Even though we may doubt and go through uncertainty, this is who he is. And we can turn to it every day. And I'm sure like, like uh, many of you, you probably have multiple copies of it. But we must be reading it. And the last thing he says here in verse, uh, verse 7, God will be with us. He says this many times, doesn't he, through this psalm. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Isn't it interesting, he says this moment where he says he is with us. We, we notice at the beginning of this little section in uh, verse 4, he talks about uh, the, the river. God has a river, and all of a sudden there's a, there's a character in the midst of the river. There's someone in the midst of the city, and we know who that is. right? If you go to Scripture and you look about these times, you, you know, we see this person in the midst of the temple scholars as a boy. And others being shocked at his understanding. We see him in the midst of the upper room after the resurrection, ministering to his disciples. We see him in the midst of the lampstands of the churches of Revelation, right? And, and as a New Testament church, we know he's in the midst of us. He's in the midst of the throne. He's in the midst of where the angels sing, <clears throat> excuse me, the angels sing, and the elders, uh, and the four and the twenty elders in the glory. We see him in the midst of church discipline, when he says, when you go in the context of church discipline, even there, I am with you, and two or three are gathered together, I will be with you. We know who this is. And what's interesting from this psalm is that we do see this, this wording, the words with us, 
uh, is where we get this messianic title, Emmanuel. God is with us. The, the psalmist has a prophetic element that this is the reality. Christ will come. Today we get to enjoy that. We know exactly who he is. See, now why is that so important is the fact that he is constantly present. Do you realize that in the middle of your problem, your trial, your situation, there is the King of kings and the Lord of lords in the midst with you. See, when Joseph was crying in that pit and his brothers were contemplating, uh, should we kill him? And he's overhearing it. You can imagine the dread and the fear. Christ was in the midst. Christ was with him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the fiery furnace. Why is there four? Because he's in the midst of them. So when the church assembles on Sunday morning and we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we worship, there's a special presence. Christ is in the midst of us. That's something we must understand because we will go from here and Monday morning is going to happen. And we're going to go through that trial or it's going to be in front of us again and we're going to have moments where we go, I'm not so sure. No, he, he is with you. He is constant. He's closer than a brother. It's no accident here at the end of verse 7 that the psalmist says, the Lord of hosts is with us. Here's the name Yahweh, covenant name, self-existent one, the covenant name for Israel. See, this morning we took communion, and what did Jesus tell us? This is a new covenant in my blood. See, he holds true to his purposes. He doesn't waver because that's who he is. So if you go out from, from these areas and the service is over and you have a moment where you think it's not for you, then either I have done a poor job of communicating that he is with us or you just don't believe it. He is constant. The psalmist never wavers. This is who God is. He adds a prophetic word for us that we would, we would know as a New Testament church, he's speaking of Christ. That's who he is. You'll notice in this, this psalm, it's broken in really into three, three sections, uh, followed by the Selah. But the last two, verses 8 through 10, I, it's really one section, but I, I broke them up. Because here the psalmist, he changes from telling us about who he is just now he's talking to us and he's telling you to do something. And I broke this into two points and, and this is my third point, verses eight and nine is God is the mighty ruler to behold. You are to come. He says, come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot. In the fire, he says, come and gaze, come and mentally perceive, contemplate. That's the word behold. Come and behold who this God is, who this king is. And the psalmist says, uh, some, some past tense as he's looking. You can tell he's looking upon the situation. He sees the battle. You can imagine the destruction, right, that he sees out there with his own eyes. And he says, all right, he has made desolations on the earth. He has done this, past tense. He has a prophetic sense. He looks forward to the day of Jesus coming. The works of the Lord. Come behold the works. There's a prophetic element, right, for us. And then there's a present tense, right? He's engaged in the deadly struggle. See, for us, even though it's a physical battle there for them, for us, we struggle, right, against who? Not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And the psalmist has this idea that come and look, be encouraged with the testimonies of who God is and the testimonies of, of God's greatness and, and what he's done in the cross. Come and look upon this because there's an element of a future involved. There's things that are happening in your life, things that you're going to struggle with, and you have to know that you have a real enemy. He puts this right into this, and he, so he says, come and behold. Come and behold. We are to know, past tense, what Christ has done. He has destroyed Satan at Calvary. He has done that. We are to look forward prophetically to the final day, the end of all of it, where there's no more pain or sorrow, where we see the final destruction of the evil one. And we are today to behold, present tense, Christ. He's calling us to come, come and gaze at Christ, come and mentally perceive Christ, come and contemplate 
Christ. So this is who God is. The psalmist now changes and you see him. Come, behold him. And the last point is simply this. God is the mighty ruler to believe. Verses 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Are we faced with problems this morning? Are you struggling with trials? Is there something weighing upon your soul? Well, the psalmist says, come and behold him. Come and believe on him. Determined today, the psalmist says, to believe on him. He says three things. Believe in God's person. Believe that he is true to scripture. Spend time in his word. Put him first. Make him number one. See the commands of scripture. Let them be a joy to your heart. You know, we sing, uh, um, it's been a while since I've sung it, but take time to be holy. Love these words of this hymn. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with the Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Spend time with him. Believe in God's person. Believe in the, the fact that he reigns. I love how the Bible never makes an excuse for God's majesty. and his He is. He reigns. Believe on that. Second thing he says is believe in God's plan. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. See, God's plan is not to let the enemy win. God will be exalted in our circumstances, in our trials, in our brokenness, in our uncertainty, in our fears, whatever you're going through. See, the question really is, will God be glorified? Is can you believe it? Can you accept that? That even in your trial and your brokenness, God is going to glorify himself. Paul says it like this in Romans 8, 28 and 29, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. See, your trial, what you're going through, the Lord is shaping you into the image of his son. He will be glorified in that. In the last verse 11 here, we must believe in God's presence. We see it over and over again, but the Lord of hosts is with us. If the, if the psalmist is going to say this and say this and say this, we need to say this and say this and say this. The Lord of hosts is with us. God of Jacob is our refuge. He begins this way. He ends this way. We see it in verse 1, verse 11, verse 7. We see it throughout the psalm, right? This is who he is. He is with us. The mighty Jehovah is our strength. He's our presence. He's a real help, not a faulty help or a wannabe help. No, he's the real deal, right? He's a real help. This is, this is wonderful news because here he says he's the Lord of hosts is with us, not the angels. And though that's great, right, that we'd have the angels with us, but he's the Lord over the hosts. Uh, Christ himself will be with us. And you have this moment where you'd say, what more could we ask? And he ends by saying, this is the God of Jacob will be our refuge. Think of Jacob's life. You know, this deceitful shepherd, right? God took this, this gentleman who, who lied and did a bunch of different things, turns him into Israel. So, you know, if you're going to go out from this from this service today and, and question God's ability and might and question uh, the, the, the issues, the trials, the concerns. And man, you haven't come to know the God of Scripture. I wish I could give you answers for the trials and the things that you walk through. I wish I could say this is why, but my confidence comes from Scripture. And I would say as long as your eyes are on the, the God of Scripture, He is shaping you to the image of His Son, and you can be confident in that. He's making bowls for royal use, as Paul says in Romans chapter 9. He's shaping you. You are precious. You are near and dear to him. We must never question his love. To question the love of God is to question the very cross of Christ. He loves his children. He loves his church. Here in a moment, I'd like to close. We're going to close by singing since I've talked about it and I've 
title my sermon after it, The Mighty Fortress is Our God. But I think it's good for us, regardless of where you're at, what you're going through, to know God is not absent. God doesn't give up. He doesn't, doesn't give away. He doesn't, doesn't walk away. He doesn't, doesn't do those things. And we might be go, <clears throat> excuse me, going through hardships because of decisions, and maybe uh, the Lord is disciplining us. But ultimately, he is shaping us to the image of his son. I want you to be encouraged, and as we think about October 31st, this defining moment in church history, think of all the uncertainties and all the things that yet God has been constant. And if you ever have a moment where you question this, right, maybe you can call me and say, hey, come and sing with me Psalm 46. I'll sing it with you. Be like Martin Luther saying, let's come, let's go sing Psalm 46. Maybe you'd like to sing the hymn, that's fine too, we'll let you do that. But Come back. Say, how did Martin Luther make it through? He kept coming back to the Bible. Keep coming back to the Bible. Don't give in, don't give up. Trust the Lord is at work. Behold him. Believe on him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray that each and every one of us would be encouraged that now you reign, you're in control. God, thank you that there's never a moment where you're away from us and that we can look upon this life and, and know that because you reign, because you're sovereign, that there's purpose in the pain. And I know that resonates with every single one of us in this building this morning. So it, it tells us how important it is that we know you that we know what your word says about you, what it has revealed about you. Lord, let us believe it. Let us trust it. In the moments where we may question or we're fearful or we're not thinking right, Lord, by your spirit, renew our minds. Bring us back to Calvary. Bring us to Psalm 46. Bring us to the fact that you are a refuge, a real help, real strength, real power in a personal way. Let us hold on to that. We thank you, Lord. We pray this in the wonderful, powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> well, as we close, if, you would, uh, if you'd like, you can open a hymnal. If you grab your hymnal. Um, I asked the band, I, well, I didn't ask him. I just told him this is what's happening. I would like to close by singing this a cappella. It's hymn number 26, if you're grabbing a hymnal. The words will be on the screen, too, if you don't have a hymnal. And this is one of those moments, I'll be honest with you, that uh, if it goes really good, we might do it again, but if it's pretty rough, we... <laughs> Just see, but I have a feeling it's going to go really good. So with our closing benediction, and, and before we sing, if there's questions about believing or knowing Christ, if there's questions about... Um, the Reformation and all those things. I would or about the sermon. I'd love to help you. I'm always available. Uh, just let me know. But as we close, let's stand and let's sing. A mighty fortress is our God. Let's be encouraged by these words. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal lives prevailing. Lord, still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Dost ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, Lord Sabbath, His name.
from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fail him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them. <clears throat> The Spirit and the gifts are ours through Him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Let's do the amen. Hey, amen. All right, good enough. I messed that up. Lord bless you. Go in his grace and his mercy. Lord be with you today.